10% heal completely from autism, but what about the 90%? It's a very good question. So in 2010, researchers reported results from following 207 kids diagnosed with autism at the age 2 and found that about 9% showed optimal progress at age 4, meaning that they had autism at age 2 and no longer had autism at age 4. That's what these researchers are classifying optimal progress as. That means they've healed completely from autism. But the researchers were a little hesitant to say optimal outcome because they said, well, these kids are only four years old, so we don't want to put too much pressure on them. <laughs> I've, I've actually spoken to the researchers and asked them point blank, why is it optimal progress as opposed to something else? But that is the reason why for four-year-olds, they use the term optimal progress. So a quote from the research, although for many children, autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong disability, a subset of children with ASD lose their diagnosis and show typical cognitive and adaptive abilities. So this is where the stat 10% heal completely from autism comes from. And this is well-regarded research, extremely highly regarded research. But you can see how the verbiage, the words that are used here in that one sentence, you know, now they're talking about lose their diagnosis. And then optimal progress is what was discussed in the first paragraph. But optimal outcome technically is what scientists prefer to use when someone has moved off the spectrum completely and they're a little bit older. Many people use the word heal, some use the word cure, and others use the word recovery. Regardless of which word you use, you need to understand that healing from autism completely is possible. Regardless of what you call it, whether it's lose the diagnosis, optimal progress, optimal outcome, heal, cure, recovery, moving off the spectrum completely is possible and routinely done. So, was this research the only study that quantified total healing? No. There's many studies. Let me just walk you through two. So one article, one scientific article, is called Recovery from the Diagnosis of Autism and then question mark. These researchers conclude that out of 208 kids with autism that they studied, 17 no longer had autism, although there were other issues. Another research, and this one is from Spain, the Spanish researchers found that about 20% of the children diagnosed with autism ceased to meet the criteria on which their diagnosis was based. And, furthermore, achieve a satisfactory social and occupational adjustment. The numbers, the actual percentages, they do vary from country to country, but it's great to see that complete and total healing from autism is possible worldwide. Optimal outcome is actually a field of research. This is not discussed often in mainstream media, but optimal outcome, meaning complete healing from autism, losing their diagnosis, recovery, cure, whatever word you want to use, it's actually a field of research, active research with researchers really trying to understand how this is happening because it does happen and it happens so frequently that there is now a field of research in autism studying how are people no longer on the spectrum. So Autism Speaks 2017 report on autism and health states that between 54 and 70 percent of people with autism also have one or more other mental health conditions such as ADHD, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. Now another part of research is studying what happens after this optimal outcome, what happens after someone heals completely from autism? Then what do they do? So here's a quote from an article. Since autism spectrum disorder is often comorbid with psychiatric disorders, 
Children who no longer meet criteria for ASD, optimal outcome, may still be at risk for psychiatric disorders. So the research into healing completely from autism is so advanced that they're at the point of studying what else happens once a child comes off the spectrum, what other things should the parent be looking out for when someone comes off the spectrum. So that's how far this research has advanced. And in the scientific world, that is. That's how far this research has advanced. This information is really not well known in mainstream, but you know it now. Let's get back to the 90%. So what is happening with the 90%? With that 90%, it's just not quantified yet. So there's some really great research out there showing improvements, and that's what I want to show in the next two research reports that I go through. Stability and change in ASD symptoms from childhood to young adulthood. This is an abstract from an autism research meeting that just occurred in May 2017. So this is about as cutting edge research on autism that you can get. So these researchers were exploring if all symptoms improve or do specific symptoms have their own healing trajectories. So they studied 132 children that were followed from the age 2 all the way through the age of 18. So they followed each individual child. They recruited them at age 2 and then followed them for 16 years. They assessed them at 5 ages, 2, 3, 5, 9, and 18. And most were language delayed at age 2. So they were able to break down the children into these groups, verbal at age 2 and verbal at 18 delayed at two and verbal at 18. Amazing how that's a group, right? Don't let anyone tell you that if your child's not speaking at age two, that they won't be able to be speaking let's say, at age 18. Because you can see from these researchers, that's one of their groups that they're studying. Delayed speech at age two and verbal at 18. It's possible, right? They're not even questioning, is that possible? No. The researchers in autism clearly know that autism symptoms change throughout a child's life. That's a fact of autism that is not even questioned anymore. And you can see that is true because one of the groups here is delayed at age 2, verbal at age 18. And the last group is delayed at age 2 and minimally verbal at 18. And these researchers were looking at nonverbal behaviors, shared enjoyment, and socio-emotional reciprocity. Let's look at the results. Consistent with other research, overall symptoms decreased. Okay, that just sentence of itself, that tells you what the 90% are doing. Consistent with other research, overall symptoms decreased. That's how the 90% is handled. The minimally verbal group experienced the most persistent symptoms and least improvement. That makes sense. Reduction of most symptoms seems to be related to language development. Items relating to nonverbal communicative behaviors, inappropriate facial expressions, and social smiling showed stable or worsening trajectories. Now, when I read that, I thought, oh my goodness, that makes total sense, especially if you're trying to use ABA to teach something like facial expressions. So I would love to know a little bit more as to what were used to try and teach nonverbal communicative behaviors, but that's besides the point. This data suggests, however, that apparent improvements in some symptoms may be attributable to language gains. These findings underscore the difficulty in separating social and language abilities and the need to consider language skills when interpreting estimates of social communicative behaviors. It's amazing, absolutely amazing, that these researchers know symptoms can be approved. And here, they're attributing them to language gains. So the more your child can speak and communicate, the less their symptoms. And that makes total sense. It's what we're striving to, I believe, as parents. At least I know that's that's what I do. I want to know what my daughter is thinking, feeling, 
that's what matters and that's where connection comes from. So it makes sense that other autism symptoms would decrease when you start building that connection with your child. So again, this is the 90%. Overall symptoms decreased. Things can get better. It's just there isn't a quantification of how much better they're getting. A second study, this is about IQ. And this, whew, I was so happy to read this research. All right, it's titled IQ-based developmental phenotypes of ASD between ages 2 to 7 years and their correlates. This was a longitudinal study of intelligence quotient, IQ, of 97 children with ASD. Now, we all know there is something called the low-functioning part of the spectrum, and that's basically children who show low IQs. And now, unfortunately, many people wrongly believe that if someone has a low IQ, when they're on the autism spectrum, that means that they'll always have a low IQ. Not true. These researchers follow changes in IQ, adaptive functioning, problem behaviors, and autism severity. There were three groups. First one is called greater challenges, meaning their IQs were less than or equal to 77 at both times that they were measured. And there were 36 children in this group. That represents about 37% of the cohorts in the study. Then there's a second group called lesser challenges, and the children in this group had IQs of greater than or equal to 75 at both times that were measured. And there were 23 children in this cohort, and that's about 24% of the study. Now, this group, awesomely, they call the changers, the IQs were less than 82 at age 2, and the IQs were greater than or equal to 70 at age 7 with an increase of one or more standard deviations. That is amazing! There were 38 children that were part of this changers group, and that represented 39% of the cohort studied in this longitudinal study. Amazing! Absolutely amazing for almost 40 percent of children studied increased in their iq ah oh, my goodness everyone needs to know that you cannot underestimate a low functioning autistic child you cannot because things can change and scientifically it's proven that things can change i know as a parent we kind of know these things but now the science is there to back us up so 39% of these children started with IQs that were very low initially, but increased in IQ by at least one standard deviation, aka the changers. I like that. <laughs> That's a good nickname, the changers. This changers group also showed significant reductions in externalizing symptoms by age 7, suggesting that reducing these symptoms by middle childhood is related to positive changes in cognitive development and adaptive functioning. Only the lesser challenges group showed a significant reduction in autism symptom severity during this period. Now that statement is just like, wah! <laughs> there's the 90%, again, there's that 90%. They, they show a significant reduction in autism symptom severity during that period from age two to seven. Now, one of the other really exciting things is it's generally thought that IQ stabilizes by the age of five. So this research not only is fantastic in that it's showing to have faith in our children who are on the low end of the autism spectrum. These scientists were able to study a change in IQ past that critical period of a five-year-old, right? There, there's again that, that window of opportunity, that pressure that we all feel. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I gotta get things done for my child before they hit five. <gasps> no, no. Th this research blows that window of opportunity theory out of the water. It's not true. 
And the fantastic thing is these researchers are continuing to follow these children to see how they progress through the rest of their life. So this is amazing research. I hope you're as excited as I am. I'm beyond excited. This is... Don't give up on the 90%. Don't just think, okay, the 90%, yeah, nothing happens, and you're just stuck the way you are, and there's nothing you can do. Ah, that's so far from the truth. It's unbelievable. So 10% ballpark completely heal when that's only what researchers are studying. But there's so much great stuff that can happen with the 90%. And this really is just the beginning of understanding autism. And our children are wonderful. Don't give up on them. There's such great things for them. And here are some references.